Good. Good afternoon. How was lunch? It was good? Okay, excellent. All right, try not to fall asleep on me because I know it's the digestive hour, but I want to I wanna keep you uh, alive and attentive, right, as I tell you my story. The first part of my story is really, really important, but it's not on the screen yet. And that's my name. Do you know my name? Boulanger, do you know how to spell my name? <laughs> she just, Miss Markham, you just told them how to spell my name? Good, so you remember, right? B O U L A N G E R. Good. So that's the first thing you should put in your notes so you remember if you have a question, you can come back and ask me, right? Excellent. Good. Do you know what my last name means? But do you know what it means? Because my last name means something. Do you know where I'm from? France. France. So in French, boulanger means something. It means baker. That's what boulanger means. Right? It's baker. You don't have to put that in your notes. That's not as important. Right? But you'll see why it's important to the story right here. Do, have some of you heard of the expression my 15 minutes of fame. Not 15 seconds, but 15 minutes. Yes, you heard of that before on the TV probably, right? That's an expression that's been around for a while. Do you know what it means? A short time of fame, exactly. What happens sometimes is that everyday people end up on television. Not celebrities, right? You expect to see celebrities on television. But no, everyday people like you and I happen to be on television. Maybe a reporter was at the Henshin Mall and is just taking a video and they ask you a question and they show your face on TV in the news report. And your grandma sees you and says, hey, I saw you on television. And you get your 15 minutes of fame. That's, a, that's an expression that comes from uh, the US, right? And refers back to the days of television when people showed up on television. I use that expression, but I shorten it to 15 seconds of fame because I'm not talking about the television today. You know what I'm talking about? Twitter, right? I'm talking about the internet. And so I'm going to talk about the time when I got my 15 seconds of fame, thanks to Twitter. Back in 2016, that was already the case. I was already on a lot of social media when this happens. Do you know what this is? It's a typhoon. It's a typhoon over the island of Taiwan, right? Where we are right now. Do you remember this typhoon? Oh, I think maybe you do. It was, you're in grade 7 now, right? It was at the beginning of grade 6. And in fact, we didn't get a whole day off. We got a half day. And at lunchtime, they said, hey, it's time to go home. This typhoon is going to be bad. Do you remember that one? Do you remember how bad it was? It was bad. It got bad. There was water everywhere. There was water everywhere. This typhoon, the typhoon name was... And uh, what I did is, you know, on the way back home, I picked up my son. My whole family got back in the house. I did what everybody does during a typhoon. I stayed home, right? I closed all the windows and, and I uh, looked at it happen. I got a ton of water. Balcony. There's a ton of water everywhere. There were huge winds. And in fact, from my apartment, I have a great view of Audzidi. Audzidi Park. You know where that is? Yeah? Have you been there before? So I look from my back balcony. I can see everything that's happening on Audzidi. And I did what I like to do when something a little bit special happens, is I took my cameras out. And I started filming. I started taking videos. I didn't go outside. I didn't leave my apartment building. Why not? There's a typhoon, right? I'm not crazy. I don't want to go out and get hit by a branch or something that flies by. No, I just went outside 
and uh, sorry, I didn't go outside. I just opened a little bit the windows when I could. I went on the balcony, but you saw the amount of water I got on my balcony. I determined, no, 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 this is, this is not safe. I'm going to stay outside, and I started taking my cameras out and filming. And in fact, I filmed with my big SLR, you know, like the, the cameras that the score. I filmed with my smaller camera, but the video that I posted right here, I actually shot with my phone. Do you want to see this video? This is what it looked like. All right? Short video, about two minutes or so. As I said, I shot that one on my phone. And then I did this. What's this? YouTube. I posted it on YouTube. As I mentioned, I am not quite the coolest kid on the block. Let me show you my YouTube channel. This is me on YouTube. 34 subscribers. That was back in 2016. I think about 21 of those are probably my family as well. Right? And maybe the rest are some teachers or some students that found me on YouTube and are like, hey, I know the guy, I'm going to subscribe. So I'm really not that popular on YouTube. When I post a video on YouTube, I don't get a lot of views. Total, all my videos got about 20,000 views because I've got one of them called Monkey Stealing Candy from Kid that has about half of the views that you see here. Why? Well, because when you post a YouTube video that says monkey stealing candy, you're going to get a lot of views, right? But it's not a very interesting video. My YouTube channel, though, is connected directly to my Twitter channel. So it asked me if I wanted to post on Twitter, and so I did. I was like, yeah, sure, of course, do that. And so my video gets tweeted on Twitter. I'm a little bit more popular, but not very much. I mean, in terms of internet, not even 2,000 followers on Twitter. Needless to say, when I, when I actually tweet something on Twitter, when I say something on Twitter, most of the time, nobody responds. Most of the time, nobody retweets it. Most of the time, nobody likes it. Thankfully, I don't base my happiness on social media, neither should you, right? It's not the amount of likes you get on Instagram or on any social media that means anything about life. Quick note, that's a quick aside, just so that you realize that. But, I don't know if you noticed, my tweet had something special. What was special about the tweet that I posted that day? It's a video. It's always a little bit more interesting than, than other tweets. What else? There was a hashtag. The hashtag I used was hashtag Typhoon Meronti. Before I posted my video, I actually looked around a little bit on Twitter just to see if people were talking about the Typhoon. And I noticed they were using this hashtag, Typhoon Meranti, and also some other hashtags. Super Typhoon, Typhoon Taiwan, uh, Taiwan Typhoon 2016. So a few were, were used. I picked that one just because I thought it was the shortest, the simplest, and explained what I was talking about the best, right? Because a hashtag Terms and determines the topic of your conversation. So that's what I did. There's also something very important about right here, which will be harder for you to, to find out. But can you guess? You can see it best in the third tweet, in the tweet on the right-hand side. Oh, hmm? Super? No, the name of the... No, that's not as important. What's important is this. Right here. What is this? 1.10 p.m. Do you remember when the typhoon happened? 
during the day. At 1.10 p.m., I was one of the first people to talk about the typhoon. I was one of the first ones to talk about Typhoon Meranti. Why? Because I literally did this. Shot a video from my house, ran to my computer, as an IT director does, and then tweeted about the video that I just posted on YouTube. Right? The day goes by, we're staying inside with my family, we're staying dry. And then, later in the evening, I got a tweet from Japan. I mentioned before, I'm not super cool, right? Which means I don't really have any super cool friends that live in Japan. I don't know many people in Japan. But there was a news channel in Japan that tweeted to me, that sent me a message and said, hey, I found your video on YouTube. It's a really nice video. It shows a lot about what's happening in Taiwan. Can I use it? What do you think they were going to use it for? The news. My video was going to be in the news in Japan. What do you think I said? Yes. Well, first I turned to my wife and my wife, you know, I asked her, I said, what do you think I should do? And my wife said, ask for money. <laughs> All right. I'm about to be popular very soon. She's like, actually, you get money out of it. But, you know, I w really wasn't too sure that they were going to show the video. So I said, no, no, I'm not going to ask for anything. I'm just happy they're going to use my video in the Japanese, on the Japanese station. The problem is I don't have a TV. I definitely don't have any Japanese channel. I don't understand Japanese. So even if my video was going to happen to be shown in Japan, uh, that was going to be a bit of a shot in the dark for me. So I wasn't going to be very big in Japan. But then, later on, I got another tweet. This time from this news outfit. Do you know who that is? The BBC. Have you heard of the BBC before? Yeah, me too. Where are they from? England, right? The UK. I get a tweet from the BBC. I turn to my wife. My wife says, ask for money this time. I'm like, no, 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 no. it's the BBC. I want to hear about the BBC. And so when they say, can we use your video? I'm like, you bet you can. Of course, yes, use my video. I'm so happy. Thank you for asking for my permission. Now, here's one thing you need to know, is every time I was contacted, the same question was asked. This question right here. May we use your video? That's a very important question. If you're a journalist, if you're a real journalist, you will always ask that question. What's the parallel in school? When you're doing your homework, what do you have to do? Cite. You need a bibliography. You need to cite, right? If you don't cite, how's it called? If you use somebody's work but you don't say you use somebody else's work, what's it called? Plagiarism. Plagiarism. It's exactly the same in the real world. It's the same when you work for the BBC. That person, that journalist, cannot come to, cannot just grab my video from YouTube and start using it. They would be plagiarized. They would actually be breaking copyright by doing that. So he has to ask me my permission. And of course I say yes. Now I'm very happy about the BBC because I'm thinking maybe I can find out and, uh, and, and I would like to know more about it but I don't have the BBC at home. The next question I want to know is, please give me the schedule. I want to tell everybody about it. I want to tell my family I'm going to be on the BBC. Just let me know when it's going to happen. The problem is the BBC is a big organization, right? So when they use something, it's like, oh, well, I'm sorry, but you know, I can't really tell you those details. We're just going to grab your video, but you know, who knows when it's going to show up. Like, okay, well, that's fun. Right? Let me screenshot this so that I know that the BBC has, has, has used my video. That'll be fun, a fun story to tell. And then, I cannot believe my luck when I get another tweet. This time, it's 9 p.m. And I don't know if any of you have tried to send an email to one of your teachers at 9 p.m. at night. But I can tell you one thing, they probably didn't answer. Because 9 p.m., it's bedtime for teachers. 
Am I right? Oh, pfft, absolutely. All your teachers go to bed at 9 p.m. Yes, indeed. That's a rule. That's a rule of thumb. So if you need an answer from your teacher, you email them before 9 p.m. This gentleman right here, Mr. George Sargent, sends me a tweet at 9.08 p.m. I had a really crazy day. There was a typhoon in my city. I was on Japanese TV. The BBC had contacted me. I was ready. I was in my pajamas, but I was ready. So George Sargent sends me a message, and he works for an organization called Reuters. Have you heard of Reuters before? No, probably not, right? Maybe, but not really. Now, there's something to know about the way the news network work. And it's the fact that they work a lot with Reuters and they work a lot with AFP, Agence France Presse. What does Reuters do? Well, think a little bit about what's happening right here, right? What's happening in Taiwan? There's a typhoon. The BBC in England wants to talk about the typhoon. Does the BBC have an office in Taiwan? Maybe they do, but if they have an office here, where is their office? Probably Taipei, right? So if they want to talk about a typhoon in Gao, they need to send somebody, they need to send a journalist all the way down to talk about a typhoon in Gaoshan. How many times do we get typhoons in Gaoshan? At least once a year, sometimes more. They would send people here all the time. They don't do that. Why don't they do that? Hmm? There's people that post that to YouTube and think about all the events happening everywhere in the world, right? Some of them that you can predict, like there's an election uh, happening in Chile. Well, you can send somebody maybe ahead of time. Some you cannot predict. There's an earthquake happening in California, right? So. If you're a big news organization, you need to send people all over the world all the time. It's going to cost you a lot of money, right? Instead, it's much better if you can buy your news information from somebody else. And that's what Reuters and that's what AFP and AP do. They actually create news. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but sometimes you look at the news channel and they all talk about the same thing. There was a major bus accident that happened in, uh, on the East Coast in Taiwan. You see that on the first news channel, you go to another news channel, and you see the same piece of news happening. Not just the same thing, the same videos also are being shown. Have you ever noticed that? Right? And that's because it's not the news channel that made that piece, it's Reuters, and then they buy it from Reuters. Now, I know this because I know a little bit about how the news cycle works. So when George tweets to me and says, would you mind following me so I can message you? I said, yes, of course. And then follows the same similar conversation on Twitter. And I put all the, uh, all the tweets there and all the direct messages. He's a very nice man. George is a very nice man. So of course, he knows there's a catastrophe happening potentially in Gaoshan. So he asked me, he said, are you okay? Are you, are you safe? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm safe. I'm good. Thank you. I'm dry. And then I follow him. So he starts by asking me a few questions. The first question is the most important question. Can you pinpoint which is the most important question in all the ones he asked me? May I ask you? Well, you, no, that's not the most important one. It's important. We talked about that. But that's not the most important. What do you think it is? Credit is not the most important thing. There's a question that comes before that that's a lot more important to George and to me. That's the one that precedes all of those questions. Yes, the first question is the most important. May I ask if you film them? Why is it an important question? Yes, he needs to know if I'm the one who created that video. What if I answer no to that question? What does George tell me? Do you think he says, ah, oh, never mind, can I use it? 
No, you cannot do that. It's going to go, oh, sorry, I need to talk to the person who created the video. Why? What happens when you create a piece of work? What do you have when you create a piece of work? Copyright. You have the copyright, exactly. So when I post the video on YouTube, if it's my video, I get the copyright for that video. So the first thing the journalist does is he checks the copyright, says, hey, are you the person that created that piece of work? Yes. Second question is, where is it filmed? Is it, am I looking at what you say I'm looking at? Is this really Typhoon Meronti? Oh, yes. Okay, good. And then he says, can we use it? And if we use it, can I credit you? I'm like, yes. Yes, use it. Of course, what is my wife saying in the background? Take my no, actually, she didn't say anything because it's 9, what's, what time is it? 9.20 p.m., she's asleep. My wife is asleep. I'm still tweeting with my phone. She's gone. And I'm saying, yes, use it. No problem. That's totally fine. And then he sends me this. Blah, 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 blah. Do you know what this is? Sorry, what did you say? This. In terms of views, yes, kind of. But uh, this one, in fact, it's not exactly called terms of views. It's called a release, a release agreement. How would you call this in legal terms? Let's say permission. permission. It's a contract. Normally, what does a contract look like? Words on paper. Absolutely. You go to the bank here in Taiwan in Kaohsiung and you want to do anything, you get three pieces of paper, a lot of stamps, and it takes you an hour at the bank to get something done, right? Do you guys know that? Or is it just something that we do? Right? This is what happens. A contract normally is on paper. That's what it happens. In 2016, when I did this, the man from Reuters sends me legal terms, a contract, in a message on Twitter. And the answer to this is yes or no. If I say yes, then we proceed. If I say no, we have no contract, he's not going to use any of my work. This is a standard release. And I said yes, of course. And then you know what happened? Well, I went to sleep because it was 9.30 p.m., so I was getting a bit tired, right? So I fall asleep, and the following morning, I get this email. Have you heard about this man before, Ferguson Richard? <laughs> He's very famous. <laughs> He's very popular. Mr. Ferguson emails me, and he goes, Dude, your video just showed up in New Zealand. Well done, mate. I can't really do his, his Kiwi accent, but that's well done, mate. So he's watching the news from New Zealand, right? As you can see, stuff.co.nz. NZ is New Zealand. That's a news organization in New Zealand. And he saw my video. How does he know it's my video? My credit is there. And not only is it there, but when I saw the video, my video of the trees shaking goes by and it says, courtesy of Victor Boulanger. Bam! Big letters across. This is what crediting means with Reuters, right? And I'm like, this is amazing. This is so cool. Just after that, I get a WhatsApp message. This is the WhatsApp with my family and my nephew and my brother in French. Do you guys read French? You understand French? Not so much? Well, they tell me I was watching the news on the national television channel at 8 p.m., right? Like the news. You know when you sit down with your family and the news is going? The news is going on and of course they're talking about a typhoon in Taiwan because it's a big event and the whole world is talking about it. And here's a video that comes, and on the video, in big letters, my nephew looks at his uncle's name going by across, thinking, wow, my uncle is a journalist in Taiwan. Let's think a little bit about it. What happened here? Why do they get to see this in France? 
Do you remember what I said about the news, uh, the news cycle and how things work? Did France 2, France 2 is the name of the TV channel, did they come all the way to Taiwan? No, obviously not. They bought it. They bought that news piece from Reuters. So did the New Zealand channel. They bought that news piece from Reuters as well. And they saw, they showed, and people saw exactly the same thing. You know who else bought it? That I heard about afterwards, not the same day? CNN. CNN bought it, and now my buddies in, in the US are looking at it and go, whoa, that's amazing. And I'm like, I know. It's amazing. I'm loving this. It's everywhere. And then the following day, that was it, right? Nobody just emailed me anymore. Well, the video was over. There was another you know, thing happening somewhere else, and my 15 seconds were gone. But that's, that's what happened to my video. And the first lesson of this, right, it's the one we've talked about. It's this, leverage. Do you know what that picture represents? Do you know who that man is right here? It's a guy, yeah, with the long beard, an old guy, obviously. Do you know what this is called? A lever, exactly. What does a lever do? What do you do with a lever? It's what? Ah, uh, yeah, pretty much. You pull it and it brings things up. A lever, it's called a simple engine. Because if you put a lever on a fulcrum, you can lift very heavy things. On this picture right here is Archimedes. Do you say Archimedes? How do you say Archimedes in, in English? Yeah, like that? Archimedes? Archimedes, old Greek guy, right, explains how if you give him a lever long enough and a fulcrum to put it somewhere, he can actually lift the entire planet. Parable, right? He was making a point very big to make you understand what it does. But the point is, with leverage, you can use a very simple thing and make it very big. So here's my question to you here. What was my leverage? I have 34 subscribers on YouTube. Most of them my family. I have a few thousand followers. None of them really interested in what I said. What was my leverage that made it so I was all of a sudden on New Zealand TV channels, France, and CNN? Hmm? The type of video, yes, that was important, right? I was talking about a very hot topic. I was talking about something that all the journalists clearly wanted to talk about, the typhoon in Taiwan. How did they find it? How did they find me? Hashtag. They found me on the internet, but the internet is a very, very, very big place. And to find me, they used a hashtag. Hashtag. Typhoon Meranti, right? That was my leverage. That was the most important piece. Okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about your project here. You're doing a project and your topic is endangered species. What are you trying to achieve with social media? What are you trying to do with Twitter? To raise awareness. And you also want to reach out to people on Twitter, right? You want to leverage Twitter, you want to leverage social media in order to go and talk directly to the people that are most important about that topic. That's what Twitter does better than anything else, right? If you want, you can tweet to the President of the United States tomorrow. Is he going to listen? Probably not, because a lot of people are doing that to him. But if you're doing a uh, project on an endangered species of snake in the Amazon forest, for example, and you find a scientist who's really, really interested in that topic, the chances are very good that you'll get a response from that scientist. Let's talk a little bit about what it takes to engage and do research with Twitter, right? Most of you have created Twitter accounts right now, right? How many of you have put profile pictures? All of you? 
How many of you, and I'm looking at the boys now, have put funny profile picture? Oh, you're good. You're better than the class before you, right? The first thing I'm talking about here is identification. On Twitter, for this particular, for this particular research project you're going to do, as you reach out to people, what's the first thing they're going to do? They're going to look at your profile back, right? And you have to be very honest about who you are. You cannot show like a joker. You can't put a, a, a picture of a meme as your profile picture, right? You can't put a dictator as a profile pic, for example. If you do that, what's going to happen? Exactly. They don't think you're, you're serious. They're not going to take you seriously if you do that, right? So you need to put a picture. You don't have to put your face on it. That's fine. You can put another picture. A lot of people put their photo on it. But at least in the description of your profile, you need to identify yourself as a middle school student. So that when people engage back with you, they understand where you're coming from. A lot of people are very rude on social media, especially when they misunderstand where you're coming from. Right? So be safe. I'm not telling you to put your address. Obviously, you know better than that, putting your last name, etc., etc. What I'm saying is let them know that you're a middle school student, and when you engage them, let them know that you're doing a research project. Okay? Now, how do you find the people you engage with? That's the introduction. How do you find them? Do you have any, uh, any idea how, how to find things? Search. Search, right? But the problem, and that's the piece I absolutely hate about Twitter. I don't know for you, Miss Markham. Searching on Twitter is awful. It's so bad because there's so many things happening all the time, right? There's a ton of tweets happening all the time. In fact, I don't know if you have the Twitter app on your phone, but if you check it, it's literally like it just, it just keeps on refreshing. There's more and more and more and more all the time. So that's what makes searching very difficult. So the first thing you should do is you should identify the keywords for your research, right? Say that you are very interested in snake. What's one of the keywords you should be using? Snakes. How do you call it interested in snakes? Snakeologist. Snakeologist. <laughs> mm, good guess, but incorrect guess. No, there's a very technical term for that. In fact, I don't know very well how to say it, but it's a herpetologist. Herpetologist? Yeah, I think it is. You're correct. Herpetologist is a person that specializes in snakes. Well, that's a great way to get started with this. So when you look at your particular species, right, start looking at the Latin names at the genus, right, of the species so that you can Look for keywords that you can search for that a little bit more that will narrow it better than snakes. Because obviously, if you search for snakes, you'll then find a lot of tweets about, well, that person is just a snake. And that tweet has nothing to do about saving snakes in the Amazon, right? Um, in the hashtags as well, you need to start filtering the hashtags to the one that are most important. Now, will you come up with those hashtags like I did with mine? No. No, no. Don't. Look for hashtags that are used a lot, right? Because if a hashtag is used a lot, that means the conversation is alive. A lot of people are talking about it, so that's good. That's what you want, right? And then um, another thing is you need to identify who talks the most in those conversations. And look at their profiles and see if they are experts. And you know how you can find out if a person is an expert? They'll tell you. They will tell you, I'm an expert in snakes. I have an MD in herpetology. Do you know what an MD is? Master's degree, right? They will tell you in their profile because they worked really, really hard. They worked many years in getting their MD. That's all they care about right now is snakes. You will look in their profile and they will tell you, I'm all about snakes, right? You will also find organizations that are there to protect snakes all across the world. And so you can reach out to them as well. Brings me to that last, last point, communication. 
how do you communicate with those people? Example one. Hey, how are you? Is that going to work? No, right? If your profile is a smiley face and you send a tweet that goes, hi, how are you? What's going to happen? Nothing. They're going to totally ignore you. Now, here's how you start your question. That's probably something you want to write notes on if you haven't put any notes on. Words that work wonderful with people that know things. Can you help me with? Whatever it is you want to talk about. When you ask for help, people will respond. Can you help me with? Does anyone know about? And then your topic. Because you know people that know about things, you know what they love doing? Telling you about those things, right? That's why we are teachers. Know-it-alls. They love talking about what they know all the time. So if you say, do you know about, I can guarantee you there'll be somebody that says, oh, I know. Can you help me with? People like to be helpful. Yes, they will help you. They will reach out to you. And then you can do that within the context of a hashtag, or you can do that with a question to a direct person, right, to an expert. On a separate document, because Twitter is messy, maybe in a Google Doc, keep track of the people you try to reach out to, right? Look at the number of followers they have. If somebody has 30 million followers, what's going to happen when you tweet to them? Nah, they have a lot of people probably tweeting at them. They probably won't have the time. But if, like me, they have a few thousand people and you reach out to them and, and they ask you, say, hey, can you tell me more about technology in schools? I'll be like, yeah, of course. I know everything about technology in schools. Right? So look at those people, those people that are eager, that are on Twitter, not the old academic that tweeted one time in 2002 because that person is not going to you know, be on Twitter ever, but at the scientist that's there every day, that's telling you about the rain conditions in the Amazon forest, and that's active, right? There are things. Those are the people that will respond to you. Right? So these three things. Make sure you identify your th you, yourself properly. That's important. Make sure that you do the research well and that you introduce your topic with the right hashtags and to the right experts. And then the third point, make sure that when you communicate, you're respectful. You ask for help or you ask if someone knows how to answer a question. I think if you do these three things right, you will probably be successful at getting to people on Twitter. Do you have any questions about this, about social media or anything that happened? No? We're good? Well, thank you very much and good luck. And remember, happiness is not on social media. It's not the number of people that follow you, that like you, that do things on social media. My dear followers are not the people that make me happy. It's my dear friends that make me happy. Yeah, I know. I know. We all do. And we all hope that they respond. But a little word goes a lot longer way than a like. Okay? Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. I appreciate it.